thank you very much. And it's great to be here for the first ever REFCOM Global Virtual Conference taking place in November 2020. Today, I'm going to be talking about furnace coking and specifically about how velocity directly plays in to the rate of furnace coking in delayed coker furnaces. Uh, so first, we're going to review key factors that play in to coking of delayed coker furnace tubes. There are many factors, and we will not be discussing many of them in any detail whatsoever. Uh, and uh, I'll also be discussing as a key aspect of the presentation, how to apply engineering principles to perform basic calculations in order to better set reliable furnace operating ranges and to better benchmark furnace operations uh, throughout your company or the industry. And on this slide, you also see a uh, photo of your basic delayed coker unit. You see uh, a six drum coker and you see two of the furnaces in the foreground a main fractionator. And that is courtesy of uh, a presentation done by Jesus Cabello uh, back in 2014 with Foster Wheeler. Okay, so quick overview. Refiners and licensors use uh, various numerical gauges to maintain reasonable operating ranges for their furnaces. Uh, mass velocity, cold oil velocity, weight percent velocity media are all easily calculated numbers that refiners use to set operating rangers, ranges uh, for furnace pass flow rates. And we'll talk about them. Uh, more difficult calculations are velocity or equivalent resonance time. Uh, and they're difficult because you need an understanding of the vapor liquid ratio and their associated densities and those are changing as you move through the coil. Uh, the presentation will end with a discussion of DC furnace tube coking as relates to feed rates and velocity and uh, how to basically manage it and use the numbers. As a general overview and an introduction, I uh, wanted just to talk a little bit about uh, the various coking furnaces that are out there in the industry. So we've got uh, crude unit furnaces, we have vis breaker furnaces, we have delayed coker furnaces, and we have ethylene cracker furnaces. And they are all distinctly different uh, based on their operating conditions, feeds, and uh, behaviors. Uh, so the crude unit vacuum furnace typically is handling a feed that has a CCR of 212. Its coil outlet temperature is 750 to 800 Fahrenheit. And I will make an apology uh, in advance. Uh, I will be using mostly English units throughout this presentation and uh, not uh, the more conventional uh, from a world standpoint, metric units. And so again, I apologize. Um, I, I have tried to put some uh, Celsius and uh, other metric units in where I can, but it's just difficult to show both numbers. Uh, it just clutters up the presentation and, and makes it a little difficult. So uh, tried to keep it a little simpler and hope that you can make the conversions uh, either now in your head or later. Uh, Okay, so vacuum furnace is 750 to 800. The run lengths typically are quite long uh, because of the lower CCR and lower temperatures, and you may not have to do decokes for four to seven years. This breaker furnaces uh, are doing a moderate severity thermal cracking operation and typically are feeding vacuum uh, resids. They can also process other feeds. They can process uh, gas oil. They can process atmospheric resid. But you know, we're talking vacrosid, their temperatures in this case are 800 to 890. And as a result of the higher conditions and more severe cracking, the coking rate's higher and the run length is from uh, a few months to up to three years, depending on what uh, your conditions are. Delayed coker furnaces uh, typically are five to 35% CCR nominally, and the temperatures are higher, 914 to 940 Fahrenheit. And their run lengths are accordingly uh, 
less. So it can be from a, a month to two years. Ethylene cracker furnaces uh, are distinctly different uh, because they're a totally different feed. So it, it, it can be uh, gas, it can be naphtha, um, but in general, the feeds that come in are 0% CCR, uh, but the coil outlet temperatures are extremely high, 1400 to 1650 Fahrenheit. As a result, the residence times in these tubes are very low uh, as a way to create a lot of shear um, and turbulence and get a decent run length uh, before you have to decoke. And you'll see run lengths from a month to uh, th say three or four months uh, on an ethylene cracker furnace. And the other thing just to highlight is that uh, there are two ways you kind of make coke in, in a furnace. All right, so you can make it via the deposition and cross-linking of really heavy molecules, but you can also make it by the polymerization of lighter molecules. And those are all going on um, and uh, non-selectively as a function of temperature and of course the feed type. All right, so what are the fundamentally key factors for making coke in a furnace? Uh, temperature, obviously, um, but specifically it is the tube's process side film temperature that is dictating, all right? And there's a distinction between that and the bulk temperature, which we'll talk about. Um, and then the, the shear turbulence at the film interface is another important factor. And, you know, it relates to velocity and it relates to residence time. And, you know, specifically the residence time of Coke precursors and in that film layer, all right? And then, of course, another very important uh, aspect is the composition of the liquid film as we highlighted with the furnace types. Um, what assumptions are going to be implicit in this discussion relative to the benchmarking? Well, the, the benchmarking examples that I'm citing had low sodium numbers in general or had sodium levels that were determined not to affect the coking rate. So, you know, there's no catalytic effect uh, or catalytic acceleration of the uh, thermal reactions that make a higher coke uh, amount. So uh, basically, you know, for fundamental cokers, we're talking 10 to 20 weight, P weight PPM sodium. Um, on the fire side, we're are assuming very good uh, burner and flue gas behavior. So no after burning, uh, no flame impingement, and excess air levels for the most part between three and 5% or excess oxygen levels, excuse me. All right, so just doing a deeper dive into the uh, three fundamental coking factors, uh, tube process side film temperature is determined by bulk fluid temperature. It's determined by the radiant heat flux, which is expressed as BTUs per hour foot squared or you metric guys, watts per meter squared. And actually, to a small degree, it can be affected by the mass flux, um, but only a small degree. Um, uh, shear turbulence at the film interface, or basically the residence time of Coke precursors in the film, uh, is to a large degree affected by the mass flux, which is pounds uh, per second per foot squared. Um, it's also affected by the percentage of velocity media with the hydrocarbons. And to a smaller degree, it is affected by the flow regime that's taking place, which nominally or liquid bubble dispersed, we'll talk more. Composition of the liquid film eh, largely can be quantified by the use of MCR or CCR, uh, microcarbon residue or con uh, Conradson carbon residue expressed in weight percent. Microcarbon residue is a more repeatable result, has a lower standard deviation versus CCR, and that's the standard technique these days. Uh, another way to look at composition would be to perform a more extensive analysis called SARA, which uh, identifies the weight percent saturates from aromatics resins and asphaltines, those being the uh, normal heptane and solubles. Uh, in addition, uh, related to that analysis is the uh, whether or not you add FCC slurry oil to your feed. That's a, 
uh, a high aromatic stream that you some well a lot of refiners may use to uh, actually uh, use for either coke morphology or uh, coke formation rate reduction effects. Uh, other compositional effects could be, you know, how much natural recycle you have on the coker or how much pump distillate recycle you have. Uh, other factors, like mentioned sodium, uh, oxygen, the level of metals, vanadium, nickel, molybdenum, have been identified as contributors uh, to coking rate. All right, so I've got on this slide a schematic and a lot of Folks have seen the general schematic. This actually is from a presentation in 2002 by Tony Barletta, who uh, uh, wrote an article in uh, refining, digital refining uh, about vacuum furnaces and why they coke. And so he put together a nice schematic and I'm just using it because I think it expresses uh, what's going on pretty clearly. Uh, the diagram shows how the coke layer, due to its insulating effect, increases to a metal temperature. And as a general rule of thumb, uh, you know, a quarter inch of coke, which is a little over six millimeters, is equivalent to about 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 56 Celsius of TMT rise, due to its insulating effect and you know, basically slowing down the heat transfer. Uh, and you know, if we look at the, the sketch, we can see in this example, and this is a, a vacuum heater, it's actually not a delayed coker heater, but completely analogous what's going on. Uh, in this case, uh, on the outside of the tube, we have a TMT at the top of 824, and then there's a slight drop across the, the metal of the tube. Usually that's pretty close to zero. And uh, then we hit, in this case, because it's a clean tube, the inside tube wall, and that temperature in this, that he's showing is 806 degrees for a vacuum heater. Uh, and then you go through the film layer and uh, get uh, to the bulk uh, oil temperature, which is 760. All right, and then as coke forms, well, the TMT goes up because now you have the insulating uh, effect of the coke, which is expressed by the uh, red line here. And, uh, you know, in general, when you look at the tubes, we'll see a photo that that red line's actually pretty thick uh, as the coke builds up, as we talked, well, we'll talk about. So in, in his example, we've got 1100 degree tube metal temperature in the metal. The inside tube walls, uh, 1092 and, uh, the, you know, the, well, yes. And then the outside coke layer is 806. So we're taking a 280-ish degree drop through that uh, coke layer. So that coke layer in reality is probably almost three quarters of an inch. Uh, and again, the bulk fluid is 760. And the TMT basically goes up because you need to increase your heat flux to, to uh, drive the heat through the coke and get it into your bulk fluid. All right, uh, most operators with nine chrome tubes allow their TMT to rise from 150 to 250 Fahrenheit, you know, in that range, which is 80 to 140 degrees, which is equivalent to 0.4 to 0.65 inches or 10 to 16 millimeters of Coke. All right, um, so what makes people stop letting the Coke uh, layer increase in thickness? Well, in delayed cokers, it's typically the uh, risk of tube plugging during online spalling, but it also can be furnace pigging feasibility. And, uh, you know, ultimately, the, another big factor is just your tube life, all right? So if you run to higher temperatures, you're going to shorten your creep and carburization life for the tubes and have to replace at least the hotter tubes more fre frequently than you otherwise would have. All right, on this slide, I give you a couple of pictures of uh, Coke pipes and tubes and uh, a simple uh, table showing the effect of Coke thickness on tube metal temperature. So the TMT is basically the bulk temperature plus the film temper, you know, the delta T across the film, plus the delta T across the Coke, plus the delta T across the metal, which tends to be pretty low. All right. Um, 
and then in the table we see the thickness of the coke increasing from zero to three quarters of an inch and that drives the two metal temperature up from a thousand to uh, thirteen hundred. In this slide uh, I'm giving you a feel for how uh, furnace operating factors can vary furnace to furnace. And so I've got seven furnaces, A through G, and uh, they have different heat fluxes ranging from 9,200, that's BTUs per hour foot squared, up to 13,500. And that's an average rating heat flux. We'll talk about the distinction on average and peak in a second. Um, but the 13.5 as an average here is uh, corresponding to a double fired furnace design, which we'll talk more about. Um, which is a key aspect of uh, cooking rates. So uh, you can see coil inlets, they can be 450 up to 700. Crossover temperatures, uh, where you go from the convection section into the radiance section. In, this, in these examples, we're going uh, from 685 up to 782. There are people that go over 800 and um, are okay. Uh, typically, you get a little worried when you're over 800 uh, because you, you'll start forming coke in the lower part of the convection section possibly, and it's difficult to online spall and remove that coke. Um, but there are people that do uh, run uh, at 800 and you know heat flux and CCR and things like that play into it a little bit. Um, but like, gee, I'd say if you get over 820, you might start to worry about having you know higher coking rates in the lower, in the shield tubes more so than you'd like. Uh, coil outlets uh, in general range from 915 to uh, 930. If you're noticing, I've, I've got a cut B and C furnaces show 905 and 898. Well, um, those actually are not the actual coil outlet temperature. Those are the control temperatures. Um, and uh, those temperatures are being measured around 10 tubes from the outlet in these two cases. And that's because the outlet uh, thermal wells were cooking so badly they couldn't rely on them as a control point and had to go back into the furnace where coke did not form around the thermal well. All right, a uh, couple other points here, combustion air, excess air. Uh, so we have the temperature of the air and then you know the amount of excess air that's in the flame and in the uh, fuel gas mixture. So there's, Big variety in general, right? If uh, the air temperature is lower, uh, you're going to have a cooler flame, obviously, and you're going to radiate a little less heat, and you'll shift heat from the radiant to the convection. You'll have lower coking rate. Increasing excess air means you're bringing more nitrogen in, uh, and that nitrogen gives you a cooler flame and also reduces the radiant heat flux rate and shifts to the convection section and it can slow down your coking rate. Those are knobs you can play with if you uh, want to try and extend your uh, furnace run before decoke. All right, uh, another schematic here and we're going to talk about radiant heat flux and how it distributes on the tubes. I again pulled the schematic from Mr. Barletta uh, and that same 2000 two article, and again, we're looking not at a delayed coker furnace, we're looking at a, a vacuum furnace. Um, but the thing I wanted to focus on was the green line, and that green line shows the, the heat flux as well as the flue gas temperature um, as you move from the very bottom of the firebox all the way up to the bridge wall. So in the bottom part, uh, we tend, whoops, we tend to have a, a lower uh, flue gas temperature. And that's due to back mixing and, uh, you know, just what's going on a little bit below the, f the, f the flame area. And as uh, Mr. Barletta noted, the air fuel mixture does not burn instantly. The burner heat release is a function of the flame height and volume. And uh, you tend to have the peak flue gas temperature and heat flux on the order of uh, 10 tubes up or something like that. And that's sort of what this schematic reflects. Uh, and, you know, uh, furnace designers try and adjust their furnace designs to compensate for this effect, and uh, some do it better than others. But it's an important thing to, to be aware of, that you tend to have your maximum flue gas temperature, say, 6 to 12 tubes up in the tube wall. 
Okay, more on radiant heat flux. And in particular, uh, the difference between heat flux from a single fire design versus a double fire design. So we've got two schematics. And if we look up here at the single fired heat flux design, and we have a lot of old furnaces that are single fire designs. And, uh, um, you know, they, it's very expensive to retrofit these things and make them a double. It's basically cost prohibitive. So people live with these designs forever. And uh, as you can see, what a single fire design means is you have one burner row firing toward uh, a tube and there's a support wall holding that tube up. So you get more, uh, a higher radiant heat load on the flame side as you do the back side, which is reflecting off the support wall. And you can get up to a hundred degree temperature difference. As in this example, you have 1150 is the actual temperature on the back side of the tube wall and it's 1250 on the, on the front side. So, and you'll see that when you cut tubes, you will see an, more coke on the flame side than you will on that back wall side. And so it does play out and that film temperature effect is real and you can see it. Okay, in the double fire design, we, we've, we have two, two burner rows firing evenly on both sides of the tube wall, which is suspended between the, uh, the two burner rows. And you end up then with the same temperature on both sides which is nice from a even coke uh, formation standpoint, which you know, can be a factor on spalling, and it also helps the tube life. Okay, um, and I just wanted to highlight here the difference between average and peak or maximum heat fluxes. So the older single-sided uh, designs have an design, this is a grassroots basis, 9,000 BTUs an hour per foot squared. That's the average flux all around it. The peak heat flux on the flame side, however, is 13.5. So, you know, your flux on the back side is going to be a lot less than actually 9,000. Um, but you end up, you know, with a 9,000 average all around the tube. Double fire designs, uh, in, the, in you know, they vary a little bit on the average flux based on the design. They can be 12,000, in this case, 200, up to 13,000 would be sort of typical in that range, but the peak heat flux is still the same. And basically what that means is that the cooking rate fundamentally uh, is gonna be the same for a single fire or double fire design. And, uh, but you know, there's gonna be some other differences which we'll talk about. As far as debottlenecking goes, people have debottlenecked up to 18,000 BTUs an hour per foot squared for their peak heat flux. That is going to coke rather quickly. If you're running a heavy feed at that flux, you'll be looking at a month run between online spalls. Okay, a couple of uh, pictures. Here's a quick picture of single fired four pass furnace with roof tubes. And so, you know, we've got a in the convections, you know, the, we're downflow typically through furnaces, though some designers have not done it that way. Uh, but in this case, most typically you've got a steam uh, superheat section. Uh, it, uh, those are the upper tubes in the convection and then you bring your resid in, in the lower tubes, do some preheating in the convection, go through your crossover. And in this case, we're showing you have roof tubes and then those roof tubes drop down into, into wall tubes. Roof tubes tend to be pretty problematic uh, due to flame impingement, uh, as you debottleneck your furnaces, there are little pins on the size of the uh, furnace and the firebox and things like that, but they can be kind of a pain in the neck. Uh, and, you know, so basically you can see that the burners are, in this case, firing off a common firing wall here, radiating the heat onto the tube. So this is your single fired design. Okay, double fired. Uh, and in this case, we're talking about a 13,000 BTU per hour design average rating heat flux. So not 9,000, it's 13,000. Here, you know, we've got a steam superheater coil and then we've got the convection and the crossover. And we've got eight rows of burners now instead of uh, four. This is just an example of one type of design. Um, there are other ways to do your burners and people do do that. And uh, there are pluses and minuses, which I will not go into. Uh, but in this case, you can see the two burner rows. They're, they each have an individual firing wall radiating on the tube wall in the middle. 
and each of these is independently controlled uh, and that allows you to online spoil each of these passes separately if you so desire. Okay, so how does double firing really compare to single firing? Well, I already talked about the difference in the burner rows. So there's twice as many burner rows for the double fired. That's gonna make the double fired firebox a lot wider, uh, almost twice as much. Um, and as I mentioned, the double fire design has higher heat flux. So we're talking 12 to 13,000 versus 9,000, which is a 40% higher flux on average. So that means you're going to require less tube surface area to complete uh, the, you know, the, the preheat or the heat up of the resid to your outlet temperature. So that's going to reduce the coil tube length proportional to that uh, heat flux. So you'll have a tube that tube coil that's about 40% shorter than, than the uh, single fire design. All right, how does that compare from a capital investment standpoint? Well, some manufacturers have told me that the four pass double fire design is slightly more capital overall, zero to 5%, maybe up to 10, I don't know, where the cost of increased structural supports and burners is larger than the reduction in the radiant tube coil length. All right, so why has a double fire design become the industry standard if there's no difference in coking rate fundamentally and it's possibly more expensive? Uh, well, the answers are you get balanced firing on both sides, which directionally increases tube life. And online spalling is directionally completed more quickly due to less tube volume and actually less coke volume, despite the fact that you're forming a little bit more coke around the circumference of the tube on average. All right, moving to mass velocity. Uh, what is it exactly? So it is the mass of a fluid in pounds per second passing through a cross-sectional area in square feet of the furnace tube. Uh, you metric guys, if you want to convert my numbers, you can multiply by 0.205. It really should be used to assess the adequacy of a furnace at design flow rates. It should not be used to assess turndown operations since it is not the full story, okay? But from a grassroots standpoint, benchmarking just general uh, licensure designs, it's a nice thing to use. Um, so I've just quoted some numbers here, all right? And uh, you know, these are clean tube numbers. And uh, you know, yes, they're not exact, they're nominal because there's CCR, COT, flux, all that stuff to worry about. But uh, you know, 350 to 450 pounds a second per foot squared in general is considered a good design. Uh, depending on, you know, licensure preferences. Um, an adequate design is actually 260 to 350. And, you know, we know that because a lot of people used to design furnaces in that range for various reasons and they run acceptably, uh, but they're not optimal, right? And uh, less than 260 to 150, that's gonna require significant velocity media to compensate. We'll talk more about that. If you're less than 150, boy, you're probably gonna have a hard time controlling, you know, keeping your coking rate where you'd like it, unless you've just got velocity media in excess to use, which a lot of people do not. Okay, so what happens to the mass velocity as the tube forms a coke layer? Well, obviously it's gonna go up. You've got less cross-sectional area, pressure drop through the coils up. And, uh, you know, that increase is going to be a, a function of the tube ID as the coke forms. So I just threw a bunch of numbers out here. Uh, and maybe it's obvious to everyone, but I just thought I'd show you how the numbers play out. Um, if you have a 250 pound per second per foot squared mass velocity in a three inch tube, if you form a quarter inch of coke, it goes up to 360. So magically you're already up into a good range when that happens. If you're 250 in a four inch tube, you get up to 327, which isn't quite as high as you'd like from a optimal standpoint. Um, if you were, had a design basis of 350, the three inch tube and a quarter inch coke gets you to 500. If it's a four inch tube, it's going to get you, that quarter inch of uh, Coke is going to get you to 457. And uh, if you've got 350 in a four inch tube and it's a half inch, you're over 600, which is going to create very high shear rate at the film layer. And we'll talk more about that. 
All right, but first I wanted to just show you a picture of two metal temperature growth rate over time. This is an interesting example because the coking rates are very low. As it turns out, this furnace is fairly large size firebox and it was running basically at uh, design heat flux and hadn't been you know, pushed uh, beyond the design heat flux. So the, the rate at which the TMTs are growing is 0 0.6 to 1.2 degrees Fahrenheit a day, which is by most standards a low coking rate. And if you look at the scale, it's basically we're looking at almost two years of time down there. So not quite, but the, you know, the, the growth rate here to the right um, is all, like over 11 months or something. And you can see it's pretty linear as it goes up. And then in the last third of the run, it starts to, that growth rate starts to turn and slow down. And, you know, we basically attribute that to the fact that you have enough coke that the shear has increased and you have more turbulence at the foam and that is actually affecting the coke deposition rate. Okay. Now, having said that, well, I want to jump back to the other curve here, which looks pretty weird. Whoops. So you can see here in the, uh, looks like the April 93 timeframe, they were 1150 with their uh, TMT and all of a sudden it whoop, jumped up to the 1300 range. And that was because they uh, had a furnace uh, feed trip and no steam was kicked in and they did not have an automatic ramp program in place for their, their velocity steam. So the velocity steam was actually at a fairly low rate, did not change, and there was no emergency steam. So they formed a lot of coke in their tube. They didn't lose their velocity steam, um, fortunately. Uh, so that was probably the saving grace. They were actually able to come back on and run for an amazingly long time, uh, messing around with you know lower rates and and. Uh, adjusting temperatures, moving burners around, doing all kinds of things to, to maintain their run, uh, which is a, a whole presentation in itself. But I just wanted to highlight that because it's quite unusual. All right, uh, mass velocity and cold oil velocity. Back in the day, furnace designers, coker furnace designers, you know, talked about cold oil velocity as a great benchmark for comparing furnaces and uh, six feet a second is the number you hear a lot of people say yeah that's the minimum you want to run your or at least design your furnace for you can run lower as we'll talk about but uh you know if you look at and i just am presenting a bunch of numbers for those seven furnaces here and basically the six foot a second cold oil velocity which is you know the velocity of the resid in the recycle uh entering the furnace so you know it's at a uh, standard condition which is like 60 Fahrenheit density uh, 350 mass flux is about six feet a second coincidentally um, and you can see how those numbers move around in these examples uh, you can also see that you know there's velocity media being added that is really a, a small player in your mass velocity calculation, but a huge player in your uh, volumetric flow and velocity calculation. Uh, you can also see in Furnace C, we've, we've got two, two IDs, and that's because, uh, well, some furnace designers uh, increase the diameter in the last two to four tubes uh, in order to basically increase the radiant flux in that region um, and trade off mass velocity with flux and just hold coking rate constant. Uh, as it turned, you know, it's also nice from a spalling standpoint because, you know, it, 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 those tubes are now much, much less likely to uh, plug due to uh, spalled coke coming through and they do see the highest volume of coke. So there's some intangible benefits to doing it, but from a coking standpoint, it tends not to really change the run length uh, between online squalls or pigs or steam air decoking if you, that's what you're doing. Okay, uh, flow regimes. Uh, there are lots of uh, piping flow regimes to talk about, but as it turns out, at least 
half of them really don't occur. It's very difficult to create in a delayed coker furnace. And so that's why I have this big red X through the stratified wave slug and plug flow regimes. What we do see is obviously a liquid flow regime. It's liquid in the convection section, essentially. Uh, but, you know, we'll start to either add steam or start to create bubbles as the cracking uh, temperatures rise and we start to make gas, we'll get a bubble flow regime. And it is, we will see an annular flow regime and we will also see a dispersed flow as we move through the furnace. And dispersed meaning it's basically the liquid bouncing around. You know, we have a, typically, you've, I mean, you're going to have a film layer, which is like annular, but it's very thin. And you're going to have liquid bouncing in and out. And that's in the dispersed flow regime. All right. And I just wanted to, you know, show you, here's a, a, a Baker chart. And I could talk about Mr. Baker and all his tests and, that would be another presentation in all itself. It's actually a very interesting story. But if we uh, take Mr. Baker's uh, chart, he's got gas and liquid factors. You know, the, the, the amount of liquid is increasing as we go to the right on the x-axis and the amount of gas is uh, increasing as we go up the y-axis. So what we can do is we can uh, look at these uh, lines and these are the the compositional lines for four delayed coker furnaces in the last 10 tubes. And you and so basically what's happening is tube 10 uh, is down at the beginning of these lines and then the outlet of tube one is where the lines end because basically the amount of liquid is decreasing, the amount of vapor is going up. And you can see that on the Baker chart, we, we basically are moving around between a, a bubble flow regime and a dispersed flow regime. Now, there are many other ways to calculate flow regimes, uh, which again, again is another presentation. But I just wanted to show that, and that's just in general how Mr. Baker would view what's going on in the coke, you know, where the coking rates are high on our tubes. Okay, velocity media, um, when, we, when I say the word velocity media, I, I mean superheated steam, boiler feed water, or steam condensate. They can all be added into the furnace uh, to basically reduce the rate of coke formation in the tubes. Uh, how does velocity medium work? Well, it, it is increasing the velocity in the turbulence through the coil, reduces the residence time of coke precursor molecules in the, fem in the film layer. Uh, are there negative effects associated with the incremental uh, VM? Yes. Uh, it's going to increase your furnace inlet pressure. It's going to uh, adversely, potentially, in some cases, it could adversely affect your coke morphology. That added steam and, you know, what's going on in the coke drum, depends how much it is. Uh, it will uh, also increase the vapor velocity in the coke drum, which increases the foam heights. Uh, it will increase the vapor velocity in the main frac, which can contribute to tray flooding, and it increases sour water production in the overhead dissolute drum, which can also be an issue. All right. Another table, more numbers. Uh, I, I wanted to just show a few things that go on if we go theoretically or even actually from no velocity steam to 600 pounds an hour of velocity steam. So you can see the furnace duty actually goes down as that uh, steam rate is increased. And why is that you would say? Well, the residence time for the fluids is decreasing in this case from 440 seconds down to 230 seconds, which is a very significant drop in the residence time. And about, you know, nominally, I mean, 10% of the duty on the delayed coker furnace is due to the endothermic heat of cracking. And if you reduce the residence time for the liquid in the furnace, you will ha have less molecules cracking and less consumption of energy uh, endothermically. So that's why the amount of heat that's added as steam goes up decreases. Um, now, what's also interesting is what happens to film temperatures as this 
you know, and this is all based on a, a, a theoretical model. And this model assumes the heat flux is evenly distributed on each radiant tube. As I mentioned, that is actually not the case. If you're really doing a detailed model, you can split the radiant tubes up into heat flux regimes, if you will, and get a better uh, result, I would say, and a better match to reality. So, but in this case, if it's evenly distributed, you see two things going on. The, the film temperature in the last outlet tube slightly goes up because uh, of the reduced resonance time, you've got to put heat in faster. So you got to, you, got, you basically get a little bit more flux required to get to your outlet temperature, which drives your film temperature slightly. Um, but back in the tube, because of that reduced resonance time, you see lower film temperatures. So there's this kind of beneficial effect which dominates in most of the tubes and that the film temperature goes down due to the lower resonance time. All right. What's the best type of velocity media to use? Um, superheated steam appears to be the best. Uh, Mike Kimbrell, uh, former BP crude coking specialist and uh, colleague, uh, reported to the industry in the past of an event where flow was inadvertently blocked in and the pressure rose above the feed line flange bolt raising rating. This is downstream of the of the furnace, and it caused the flange to open and hydrocarbon to be released. Investiga investigation surmised that the liquid uh, velocity media, which was water, uh, entering the coil vaporized. The char charge pump check files held, and that caused the pressure to rise and rise ab above and open the, uh, uh, the flanges and lose your gasket seal. The probability of this event is low if you have a properly operated and properly maintained PLC-based valve interlock system, such that you know the chance of blocking in your furnace is very low. Um, but um, it is a risk and something that people need to consider. Okay, can you run without velocity media? Uh, yeah, you can. Um, now, you know, if you're in a low heat flux regime, your cooking rates are probably gonna go up. Um, but if you're in a high uh, mass velocity regime, like over 550 pounds per second per foot squared, industry operations have demonstrated that velocity media provides very little, if any, incremental benefit, um, you know, depending on all the other factors in play. All right, now, should you run zero or you could, but should you, well, it's kind of a good idea to always have a little bit of velocity steam going in, uh, basically a minimum flow rate of 50 to 100. It's probably a good idea, this pounds per hour, 100, yeah, in pounds per hour per pass, uh, to prevent coke obstructing the nozzle. And that allows automatically ramped steam to enter the passes in the event pass flow is lost, which supplements the emergency steam. Mention a caveat, you gotta be, check your numbers on uh, velocity steam wide open and emergency steam to make sure you don't have too much because um, that can cause problems in the coke drum and create a foam over. Uh, basically, you only need enough to maintain your normal design velocity through the coil. You know, you're, you don't have to go crazy sweeping the coil in two seconds. You know, it's okay if it sweeps in a couple of minutes. You're just trying to make sure it sweeps at a reasonable rate. All right, what is the industry range for velocity media as a weight percent of hydrocarbon flow? Uh, well, zero for sure, we just talked about that. And how high do most people go? Well, nominally 1.2 weight percent uh, steam as a percentage of the uh, hydrocarbon charge. What's optimum? Uh, that's very furnace specific. Um, First, you really need to understand the effect of velocity media on coking rate. And assuming uh, that velocity, higher velocity media rates in your case do not create a hydraulic feed limit, then you can do testing and compare one pass to another following an online spall. Uh, once the effect on coking rate is understood, all the pros and cons can be weighed and you can optimize the operation. Uh, from a control strategy standpoint for velocity media, what's the, the best? Um, so it's good to have a, a ramped control program. Uh, for a clean tube MV of 550, I would set a rate of about 100 pounds an hour per pass at the inlet to the radiant section. 
And as the pass flow rate drops, you should increase that velocity media rate to maintain a constant average velocity in the last 10 tubes of the coil. You ask, well, how do I calculate the velocity so that I can adjust my steam? All right, good question. Um, well, one way to do it is utilize a reputable process side kinetic model to perform the iterative calculation. A licensor can perform the calculations and generate the equations for you. Uh, you can also have a specialty coking company out there who's got a cute program uh, to provide a model in those calculations. They exist. Uh, if you don't have the bucks uh, and you know to do that, and these days bucks are, seem to be harder to find, um, you can utilize uh, the poor man's approach. And I'm basically talking about a vacuum resid delayed coker furnace now. So, uh, and I'm gonna provide a caveat. I, you know, you can do the calculation, but I always think it's good to have somebody check it, ideally a coker specialist. You know, your neighborhood coker specialist should weigh in, make sure it passes the funny look test. But, you know, I'm gonna try and lay out just a simple way to do it. And uh, it helps to have some, some, uh, some knowledge on the numbers. Uh, but you can select a reasonable progression from all liquid to the crossover to 85 to 90 mole percent vapor at the outlet. Um, the composition of the vapor will be largely light C6 minus gas that increases as bulk liquid residence time and temperature in the coil increase. Um, by no means will you see a vapor composition comparable to the equilibrium composition leaving the coke drum since the residence time for the hydrocarbon is three to four minutes in the furnace versus 60 uh, to complete the cracking reactions in the coke drum. Uh, pressure drop can be estimated by performing a simple crane DP calculation in the tubes for steam, hydrocarbon vapor, and hydrocarbon liquid. Once you've set that base case, you can use an Excel spreadsheet to add velocity steam as needed to hold overall velocity and pressure drop constant as hydrocarbon rate is reduced. Sounds easy, right? Okay, so uh, here's an example uh, of numbers. All right, now this is, uh, you know, you, I was talking about adjusting the velocity media to maintain design velocity in the tubes. This example actually does not do that. It uh, does a calculation for actually kind of a constant uh, velocity steam as you turn down. And, you know, I've highlighted that in the red numbers, okay? Uh, but you can just highlighting the red numbers right here. You can see the base case operation had velocities of 52 feet a second in tube eight, 70 feet a second in tube four. And then, and that was with a 1500 pound an hour steam rate. All right. Now, if I have less steam rate and I start turning the furnace down, this is what happens to the velocity. Uh, if I want to maintain, you know, that 70 number, for example, I'm going to have to increase, uh, you know, the steam to get those numbers. All right. I've also highlighted here a uh, effective emergency steam. And in this case, we're putting in over 8,000 pounds an hour in the pass. And that's generating a velocity of 135 feet a second in tube four, which you, uh, you know, probably don't need. Um, and you, you know, need to understand, you know, the risks associated with the coke drum and the foam. All right. One more example here, just to, if you really want to uh, optimize your velocity steam, you could theoretically reduce the steam as the coke forms on the tubes. And this just gives you an example of uh, what velocity steam you would need in a clean tube case versus uh, end of run coke tube case. And you can see, uh, you can maintain, you know, your velocity fairly constant by dropping the velocity steam, you know, in from anywhere from 50%, I would say, well, let's see, more than 50%, could be 60%, 25%, 30% well, to 60% in that range, uh, even more. So it all depends what's going on in the furnace and what your feeds are in the cracking. But so that's an idea, idea and it makes sense if you have problems with uh, velocity steam and just steam in general in your system, your drums, or your fractionator uh, downstream. Okay. 
And to close, um, I wanted to just briefly mention equivalent resonance time or ERT. And it's essential to Visbreaker furnace operations. And it, it's a way to, to uh, optimize the cracking in your furnace and stay on spec compatibility and stability wise with your fuel oil. So some people have used calculations, uh, equivalent resonance time calculations, as a way to adjust steam um, as rates change and as temperatures change on their furnace. And that's the difference between ERT and steam rate or uh, the, the, just a simple velocity calculation is that I'm also now going to build in coil inlet temperature and coil outlet temperature into the uh, equation and optimize on that basis. So you can do that using a Arrhenius kinetic equation and uh, you know to make this adjustment. You know what is ERT? Well it's basically the time required at a given reference temperature to achieve the conversion that you saw at either a different temperature or at a series of increasing temperatures. And it's just a, a, a a way to normalize uh, temperatures and the rate of cracking and the rate of coke formation. And like I said, it's a way to, to basically adjust your velocity steam. You still need to calculate your two-phase velocity, but you also need to build in this Arrhenius calculation to accommodate the changes in CIT and COT. If you're a delayed coker furnace in general, there doesn't, and you're not moving those temperatures around that much, there's not a lot of value in going to this length to uh, optimize, but you could do it. All right, so that closes my presentation. I appreciate your kind indulgence and attention, and I turn it back to our moderators.